All right. So uh, this unit on bonding is the culmination of the last two units on electrons, where first we started about electrons, then we started about periodic trends. Now we're going to talk about how the electrons actually bond to create compounds and how those compounds interact. Before we go any further and do anything, I need to find my laser. Which is laser beam. Where's my laser? Laser. Power. Laser. Laser. Oh, here it is. Okay. Laser. This is embarrassing. Laser. Okay. So if you follow the little green dot to the periodic table, we're going to quickly review oxidation states and electrons because this is important. Are you guys ready? Yes. Right there. See somebody goes. Oh, they went outside. Go find it. Oh, it's back. Chase it. Chase it. It went under the sofa. Okay. Uh, okay. So group one. Group one electro or group one elements have how many valence electrons? One. That's right, one. And when they lose that valence electron, they will have a common charge of what? Plus one. Group two atoms have how many valence electrons? Two. Two. And when they lose those two, what's their common ion? Plus two. Plus two. Group thirteen, boron's group has how many valence electrons? Three. Three. And they're going to do what? Lose three to have what charge? Plus three. Plus three. Carbon's group has four valence electrons, which give it some options. It can gain four and have a negative four charge, or it can lose four and have a positive four charge. Or both. Or either. Nitrogen's group has five valence electrons. What's it going to do? It's going to get three more. Oxygen's? Minus two. Minus two. And fluorine's? Minus one. So in summary, the common ions of our main group elements are plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, minus four, minus three, minus two, minus one, and the noble gases are zero. Okay. <coughs> now, that's important because we're going to move electrons around. Also important is the electronegativity of atoms. Now, all atoms want their electrons <coughs> because all atoms have protons. And since all atoms have protons, they want their electrons. But some atoms want electrons more than others. So which ones want the atoms or want the electrons more than others? Uh, first first first. Yeah, up here. <laughs> our noble gases up our, as our next to our noble gases are our halogens. They're really close to having their octet filled. So fluorine, chlorine, oxygen, these guys are our most electronegative up here. They're very, very close to having an octet. The least electronegative are down here, the lower left where they're not just going to throw their electrons away, they still want them, but they don't want them very strongly. Okay? So your most electronegative atom is fluorine, and your least are down here with cesium, rubidium, and so on. Okay? So far so good? Okay. With that, there are three kinds of bonds that we're going to study today. Excuse me. Okay. The first type is an ionic bond where an atom gives up an electron or takes an electron and becomes an ion. So just like in the video, remember the video? Yeah. The, where chlorine ripped the electron off sodium. So sodium did not have a very strong pull for that electron. Chlorine ripped the electron off sodium. Chlorine became a negative one ion. Sodium became a positive one ion. And then the most important principle in all of physical science kicked in, and that is what? Opposites attract. The opposite positive and negative charges stuck together. Okay? That's an ionic bond. It happens when one atom takes an electron from another atom, one atom becomes a positive ion, one atom becomes a negative ion, and they stick. It's an ionic bond. Not a very strong bond, but important. In a covalent bond, this is what happened in the disco. Like, we need more heat. Remember the disco? You were all awkward and like, this makes me uncomfortable. Uh, so, in a covalent bond, electrons are shared. And a covalent bond is really interesting. It works like this. Chlorine says to chlorine, Hey, chlorine, I have seven valence electrons. I need one more. Oh, really, chlorine? That's funny, because I also have seven valence electrons. I also need one more. I got an idea. What if I give you one, and then you give me one? That's a great idea. And that way, I will have eight, and you will have six. No, because the electrons will travel back and forth so fast, it will look like we both have eight. That's a great idea. And that's what they do. So the electrons, they both put in one into the pot. 
This chlorine donates one to this chlorine. This chlorine donates one to this chlorine. They both put an electron into a pot, make an electron pair. Electrons are always shared in pairs. They're always shared in pairs. They can give up or take in any number, but they're always shared in pairs. And because that electron zooms back and forth between the atoms, it's like both atoms have filled their octet. Does that make sense? Yeah. So instead of six, seven and seven, they throw an electron into the pot and they look like eight and eight because electron pairs are zooming back and forth as fast as they can, pretty close to the speed of light. They're going back and forth so that appears that each atom has an octet. Okay. Give me a thumbs up if that weird concept makes sense to you. Okay. Give me a thumbs down if you need to go over it again. All right, so, yeah? Okay, so what it basically boils down to is chlorine needs an electron. This chlorine needs an electron. So they both put an electron into the kitty, and then they share those two electrons. But because those electrons are moving back and forth so fast, it doesn't look like 8 and 6. It looks like 8 and 8. Okay. Because it looks like they both have their octet. And then metallic bonds are really slick. What happens in a metallic bond is all the protons are fixed in place, all the nuclei are fixed in place, but the electrons are all shared. Okay, kind of like. Okay, I'm sorry if this analogy makes you hungry. Kind of like if you all had popcorn and you were all sitting in the same places right you are right now, but you all had a whole bunch of popcorn. If you pass the bowl of popcorn around, you wouldn't know which popcorn is yours, which popcorn is your neighbor's. Okay, because it's all shared. Or, imagine you were all swimming, like this room is a big swimming pool, you're all um, swimming through the same water, you don't know which water is yours and which water is your neighbor's because you're all sharing it. That's how electrons work in d-block metals. They're all sharing their electrons. And I'll go into more detail about that in a little bit. Okay, any questions before we do a review? Okay, so the next slide is just review. Just want to make sure we're all on the same page before we go forward. We talked about the octet. So once again, an ion, we need to write this down, I hope. Um, an ion is just an atom that has gained or lost electrons. And an octet, yeah, that's, that's grand theft, grand theft uh, Pokemon. Um, anyway, so, so an oct the octet rule states that all atoms are working on getting their octet, and they're going to gain or lose electrons to do that. Sometimes they gain, sometimes they lose, sometimes they share. Metals and non-metals will bond. Metals will tend to give up their electrons. Non-metals will tend to lose them. So like in the video, chlorine gained an electron and became a big chlorine anion. And sodium lost an electron, becoming a little sodium cation. Okay. And again, positive ions we call cations, negative ions we call anions. Okay. So this is just for review, once again, this unit is a culmination of everything we've done in the last two units. It takes everything we learned about electrons and periodic trends and wraps it into a fun little ball we're going to call chemical bonding. <coughs> All right. <coughs> Give me a thumbs up if you're good to go. Cool. All right. So, um, in the last, at the end of the video, my animation is completely messed up on the slide. Uh, at the end of the video, uh, chlorine had gained an electron and become negative. Sodium had lost an electron and become positive. And then they all got together with other you know, cations and anions of sodium and chlorine. That's what happens uh, in table salt. The cations are attracted to the anions. So all the cations are attracted to all the anions. All the anions are attracted to all the cations. And then they arrange themselves into what's called a crystal lattice. A crystal lattice is a three-dimensional pattern of cations and anions. So positive, negative, po or negative, positive, negative, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, and so on, and they arrange themselves. This is the crystal lattice of sodium chloride. If you have the ability to look at things at the atomic level, that's what you would see. <coughs> Isn't it? You would see a cation of sodium attracted to an anion of chlorine, but also attracted to an anion of chlorine over here, and another one over here, and over here. You would see this chlorine attracted to a sodium here, a sodium down here, a sodium back here, and a sodium over here. In fact, next time you're at the cafeteria and you get a grain of, sal a grain of uh, salt, take a look at the shape of the grain of salt. 
Guess what shape it is? Crystal Yes. Oh. Is it crystal well, What shape is it? Diamond. <coughs> It's square. It's square. Yeah, it's square. It might be a cube, but it's definitely square. Okay. And uh, if you were to look at crystals of salt under a scanning electron microscope, guess what shape they would be? Squares. They, they'd be squares. They might be cubes, but they'd be squares because the crystal, the crystal lattice of sodium chloride is square. It's cube. Cubic. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, when things dissolve, I have a demo I'm going to show you later on, but when things dissolve, something really important happens. Hopefully this video will pop up like it did last year for about 20 minutes. When an ionic substance... Whoa, that was like, whoa, well, okay. Video time. This is a really valuable video. This is probably the single most important thing we're doing this entire year, is what's shown in here. When an ionic substance such as sodium chloride is placed in water, water molecules interact with the ions on the surface. If the salt is soluble, the attractive interactions with water molecules overcome the ionic attractions within the lattice. The solvated ions move off the surface and become separated in solution. Notice that water molecules cluster about the anions with the hydrogens directed toward the negatively charged ion. On the other hand, water molecules interact with the positively charged cations through the lone pairs of electrons on the oxygens. That's valuable. So valuable, I'm going to show it again and then pause it at a very important time. When an ionic substance such as sodium chloride is placed in water, Water molecules interact with the ions on the surface. If the salt is soluble, the attractive interactions with water molecules overcome the ionic attractions within the lattice. The solvated ions move off the surface and become separated in solution. Notice that water molecules cluster about the anions with the hydrogens directed toward the negatively charged ion. On the other hand, Water molecules interact with the positively charged cations through the lone pairs of electrons on the oxygens. Okay. Without going into too great a detail, this is important. You know water is H2O. Yes. Everybody knows water is H2O. And you see, you only see water drawn like that Mickey Mouse shape. Well, if you were to draw water, it would look something like this. There's your oxygen. Uh -huh. There's your hydrogen, and there's your hydrogen. Okay. Hydrogen is very small, oxygen is much bigger. Now, this is a negatively charged chlorine ion. That's a negatively charged chlorine ion. And this is a hydrogen atom, or a hydrogen yeah, atom. And then this is oxygen. So there's our water. Oxygen and hydrogen. If I was to tell you that water molecules have a positive end and a negative end, like a magnet has a north and a south pole, what side would you think was positive? The hydrogen end. Yeah. You would say the hydrogen end is probably positive because notice the hydrogen end is attracted to the negative chlorine ion. So if the hydrogen end is positive, the oxygen end must be negative. negative. There is no such thing as a monopole, meaning mono meaning one. Yeah. Nothing in the universe is a monopole. You can't have just a north. You have to have a north and a south. You can't have just a positive. Well, we you don't have, have a positive either. negative. We're flat. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Except in your world. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Like, fun fact, if you take a bar magnet that has a north and a south and you cut it in half, now you have two norths and two, two souths. So you have north and south, cut it in half, now you have north and north. South and south. North and north. Yeah. New York, New South. Okay, so similarly, there's the sodium ion. Which atom is attracted to the sodium ion? Which part of the atom? Uh, yeah, the oxygen is. So there's the oxygen, and here is the hydrogen. The hydrogen side is repelled from the ion, and the negative side is attracted to the ion. Okay, does this idea make sense? Yeah. This is because water <coughs> is. Polar. Water is polar. It has poles. It has a positive pole and a negative pole. Cool? 
Give me a thumbs up if this makes sense to you. Some of you are like, I don't get it. Okay. So once again, opposite charges attract. Positive side of water attracted the negative ion. Negative side of water attracted the positive ion. And that's how that's how water molecules tear up ion compounds. They're, they overcome the electronic uh, the ion attraction. Yeah. Water is held together with a covalent bond. And salt held together on the ionic bond. Okay. And we'll get there. So it's funny you can just say it. No, I don't know what you do. It's just. Uh, okay. One to two. Sorry. Um, so if it's covalent, how come it's charged? Because I thought like, the electrons are shared equally. They are? Oh, they are not shared equally. Exactly. We'll, we'll get there. We'll actually get, get there in about 10 minutes. Okay. So what's. I know ammonia is covalent, but that Yep. Yeah, it would. Uh, excellent question. So the question was, ammonia is polar. Would ammonia tear up a, a salt crystal too? Ammonia would do the same thing. It would tear up a salt crystal. Okay. Video. All right. Like I said, to record the video. An electrolyte is what we call a solution that conducts electricity, where the ions are chilling out in the, in the uh, solution. And we'll spend a little more time on electrolytes a little bit later. OK. Wait, what is Solution of, of ions that conducts electricity. So in an electrolyte, the ions are cruising around in solution. So they conduct electricity. Charges will go from one ion to the next ion to the next ion. But um, we'll spend a little more time on that specifically quite a bit later. So talking about ionic attraction specifically, when you have a bunch of ions that are forming a crystal lattice, you have what's called a formula unit. So the salt that you put on your potato chips, or your french fries, or your ice cream. Ooh, what? I know, right? Okay. Um, Wait, you do that? I no, I just want to make sure you're paying attention. So that salt, there's billions upon billions of sodium ions and chlorine ions but they all reduce down to the formula unit, which is just NaCl. Okay. That's also the empirical formula, NaCl. No way. Way. Okay. <laughs> so the formula unit is the most basic building block of the crystal lattice, and the empirical formula is the chemical formula of that formula unit. simple, hopefully not copying everything down and get the general idea. Give me a thumbs up if you're with me so far. Okay, some of you are still madly scribbling away trying to write everything down. Right, I'll give, you, I'll give you 10 more seconds. And the little red hand is on the three. There it goes. Okay. So, metallic bonding. <laughs> Chemical formula is a formula unit. So metallic bonding is why electron or why metals do what they do. The electrons are all shared amongst all the nuclei of the d-block metals. Okay. The electrons are all shared amongst all the nuclei of the d-block metals. Now it's kind of funny. You know that if I plug this light in, this is a light. It hopefully still works. It's like 20 years old. Um, this, if I plug this light in, electrons are going to start cruising down one pole and cruising out the other pole. Okay. Similarly, if I, you see all the electrons piled up in the wire here up to the switch? When I throw the switch, the electrons are going to try to make it to the light. But here's something kind of interesting. The electrons have to go from atom to atom to atom to atom, and they do so at about a centimeter per second. Electrons move through a wire at about a centimeter per second. So when I throw the switch, it's about, I'm going to say five meters from here to the light. That's going to take about 500 seconds. It's going to take about six, like seven or eight minutes. Okay, ready? Count. Oh. How come it turned? 
Yo, yeah, well, I'm confused. It's really fast. How come it turned on right away? The entire that's electricity. Because they're stored. Thank yeah, they're st the, the wires that go to the light, they're not empty of electrons. So every time one electron goes in one end of the wire, one electron has to come out the other end of the wire. It's kind of like if you had a big long tube of gumballs that was full of gumballs. And I was like, I was like, here, have a gumball. And I put one in, one end, what's going to happen to the other end? <laughs> One's going to fall out. Okay? And that's what happens. One electron goes into the sea, one electron comes out of the sea. Yeah. Do you want to know the mechanism of how the d block electrons work, or are you just happy to know that they work? I want to know, I want to know the mechanism. mechanism. You want a mechanism. Okay. So here's the mechanism. This is why it works. If you remember, there were S, P, D, and F orbitals. What shape was the S? Yeah, it was a sphere. And the P, dumbbells. dumbbells. And the D were like really elongated dumbbells. Okay, now here's what happens in a D block metal. You have a nucleus, and that is surrounded by an electron cloud. And you have another nucleus, which is also surrounded by an electron cloud. And you have another nucleus, which is also surrounded by an electron cloud. So with my crappy drawing, do you see how the d-block metals can actually overlap? Is this why they, in the thing earlier, they had just whacked out orbitals and like all these things floating together? Sort of. That's more math than anything else. More math. But does that does that crappy diagram uh, explain why the d-block metals can share their electrons? Yeah. So the electrons cruising along this orbital, they're like, yeah, I'm right here. They're like, whoops, now they're over here. They're like, whoops, now they're over here. So their d-block orbitals overlap, so the electrons just get shared with all the nuclei. Okay. Give me a thumbs up if you're ready to move on. Okay, this is why, again, all these properties I already talked about, this is an extremely strong bond, which is why it's really hard to break metals. Um, and this is why they have the properties that they have. We talked about these properties last time. D-block metals are lustrous, shiny. They're malleable. You can bend them and shape them to hold that shape. They're ductile. You can form them into wires. And they are really good conductors of heat and really good conductors of electricity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. This is all in the last unit. I just want to make sure we're all all on the same page before we move on. Okay. Any questions about D-block? Metallic bonding? And again, it is called metallic bonding. Another slick thing is they allow alloys to be made. Alloys are mixtures of various metals. And because copper is going to behave a lot like nickel, copper's got an electron C, nickel's got an electron C, you can just take copper and nickel and melt them together and they'll form an alloy with similar properties of both. That's your money. Your money is made of copper and nickel. Okay, moving on? Moving on. Okay, now this is the important stuff. Most of the time we're going to be spending in this unit, we're going to be spending on covalent bonding. And covalent bonding occurs when you share electrons. Electrons will always be shared in pairs. Back to our, our uh, chlorine example. Hey, chlorine, can I have an electron? Sure, chlorine, you can have an electron if I can have one of your electrons. Cool, chlorine, you'll put one in the pot, and you'll put one in the pot. Then there'll be two electrons in the pot. Let's call it a pair. That's great. It's an electron pair. An electron zooms back and forth really fast, <laughs> making the atoms think they have an octet. Okay. So electrons will always be shared. It only happens with a non-metal to non-metal uh, bond. Only non-metals will covalently bond. And because that electron doesn't, the, the, the electron pairs attracted to the nuclei of both, it's a pretty strong bond. This is where you find diamond. Diamond is, covalent, is four covalently bonded carbons connected to four other covalently bonded carbons. It's pretty slick. Okay. Rubber bands.
Who wants a rubber band? I do. Okay. I would love one. You can have a rubber band. You can have a rubber band. You can have a rubber band. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, I better give one to Gabriel. He's gonna take turns on trying. Yeah. Okay. This is what we're gonna do with the rubber band. We're going to uh, demonstrate single, double, and triple bonds. Oh, look at that snag. Okay, fine. This? <laughs> I'm wasting all my time passing the red. Okay, one more for Scott, then we're gonna. So, this is what I need you to do the rubber band. Stretch your rubber band as much as you can, and please don't try to, please don't break it, it'll snap something in the face. But stretch it as far as you can stretch it without breaking it. Okay, so, um, how many, how many rubber bands are, are connecting my thumbs? One. No, two. <laughs> one there and one there. So there's a band and there's a band. So there's two bands connecting my thumbs. Okay, this represents a single bond. A single bond is pretty long and not really very strong. Okay, um, you could e easily break this if you pulled it, like snap it right off. Pretty easy, and then go flying and hit somebody, hit your neighbor. Now if you double it, 